Our topic tonight is a fun one. It's the Gospels of Jesus' childhood. Um, so when we're thinking about uh, the life of Jesus as it's narrated in the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we have to remember that those Gospels, they're not chronologies listing dates off or histories or biographies. They're primarily narrating Jesus' public ministry, the time when he's teaching and preaching and uh, working wonders and so on, perhaps three years of the 34 or so years that he lived. The Passion narrative, the, the week of Easter, that covers about one week in Jesus' life, but it takes up a huge proportion of the Gospels that we have. So 15% of Mark's narrative, 20% of Luke and Matthew's narrative, and a whole 45% of John's uh, is just covering that one week. Um, the earliest Gospel, Mark, begins with Jesus as an adult, maybe around the age of 30, and his baptism by John the Baptist, himself a historical figure that's attested by Josephus. So in other words, there's no um, uh, narration at all in this earliest gospel uh, of Jesus's birth or, or youth or anything that takes place before this moment. Um, likewise, we've had lectures before on the lost sayings gospel or hypothetical sayings gospel. And those sayings also begin with sayings of John the Baptist. I mean, it's a sayings gospel, so it isn't collecting sayings that Jesus might have said when he was uh, a baby or a kid or something like that. Uh, but nevertheless, it also begins with John the Baptist. The Gospel of John likewise begins uh, uh, after a creation hymn uh, with kind of the preaching of John the Baptist. So this is the incident as Jesus as an adult is beginning his public ministry, and we mostly get that in those Gospels. Um, nat nativity stories, or the Christmas stories, are added uh, into the mix by the authors of Matthew and Luke. So both of those authors, as we've seen in other lectures, independently made use of the Gospel of Mark, which was written earlier, and this uh, conjectural sayings gospel Q, using those two sources, which don't have nativity stories, they independently add their own stories about Jesus's birth. So in Matthew, we have the story of Mary and Joseph, Jesus's parents who are living in Bethlehem, uh, and they have all kinds of experiences, including being visited by the wise men, the Magi, uh, in Luke, by contrast, the couple are from Nazareth, and they travel to Bethlehem for a census, and while they're uh, there, there's no room for them in the inn and so forth, and they are visited by shepherds. So those two different nativity stories that we use usually combine together to make our regular Christmas story. So after, though, those two contradictory Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke, uh, those authors also immediately jump to the baptism of Jesus and the beginning of his public ministry with just one brief interlude that we find in Luke. So in Luke, we read at the end of chapter two, quote, the child grew, Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents didn't know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Uh, then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers as a 12-year-old boy. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, "'Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you uh, in great anxiety.' And he said to them, "'Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house, that I'm in the temple, God's house?' 
but they did not understand what he said to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother, Mary, treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So that's the, the whole thing. I've read the entire, <laughs> everything that we have. So beyond his infancy, this is the only story of Jesus' childhood. Uh, Matthew records only that the family uh, fled Herod and went to Egypt for a while before, after Herod's death, relocating them to Nazareth. Um, and so we don't actually even have any stories of that, what's going on in Egypt and so on. There are no narratives at all, as I say, in Mark, John, or the rest of the canonical New Testament about Jesus' childhood. So if we kind of take this as a, a chronological map and look at this overall kind of time period from 10 BC to 50 AD or so, and we look at the, the lifetime of the historical Jesus uh, in this um, kind of time period, a lot of times people think, well, uh, since the whole idea of BC means before Christ and AD means year of the Lord, you know, shouldn't Jesus have been born, you know, in the year zero, if there were a year zero, or in other words, in one AD. Um, but the problem is that the whole, you know, AD scale, it's not like um, people in BC times were counting backwards and then suddenly they flipped at this point and they immediately adopted this scheme. This um, dating system didn't get adopted until uh, it became popularized by a medieval historian, the Venerable Bede in medieval England. So anyway, and by that time, the calculation, they didn't really exactly know when Jesus would have been born. So a lot of times people, um, since the, we talked about Herod the Great, who had been uh, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Judea, he died in 4 BC. And in Matthew's story anyway, uh, Jesus is born while Herod is still king. And so lots of people then kind of say, well, maybe Jesus was born around that time. And then we also are aware that uh, he is crucified under a governor, Roman governor Pontius Pilate. And we know kind of the dates of Pilate's ministry for, or not ministry, governorship from like 26 to, to 36. And so anyway, the uh, we kind of have a date for the end date, and he's in his like early 30s at that point. So we have kind of a sense of it, even though if we don't have the dates. But as you can kind of see here, um, the periods that are actually narrated uh, are just very brief, mostly at the end of his life, those last three years. And then we have the story of Acts that Luke continues the story of early Christianity after that, including in the middle of the 30s, the conversion of Paul, uh, the first Christian whose writings we have. So that leaves this whole big <laughs> gap uh, that we don't really have any narrative for, which is sometimes called the lost years in the life of Jesus, not narrated at all in the Bible. So lots of folks would like to fill in those blanks. <laughs> what was Jesus doing for nearly 30 years for these lost years? So you may be aware of um, a very famous poem by William Blake. Um, I think it's one of the, it's like an unofficial anthem for, for England. Um, Blake in this poem asks, in Jerusalem asks, whether the young Jesus had visited ancient Britain. And did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain green? And was the holy lamb of God, was Jesus, as a boy on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded there among these dark satanic mills of the uh, contemporary industrial revolution in England that William Blake is, is lamenting? <coughs> and so that um, poem is essentially narrating a, a legend that developed in England, especially in the Middle Ages, as part of the, uh, the romantic saga of the Holy Grail. So uh, medieval poets that were writing to entertain uh, knights and ladies. And in that kind of uh, those Holy Grail uh, romances, uh, the character of Joseph of Arimathea became connected to Britain. And so, um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea um, is a guy 
in the canonical gospels uh, who provides the tomb for Jesus. So um, in, in, that's what he, all, he, all we have. And so he's the one who collects Jesus's body and buries it in the tomb uh, after the crucifixion. Um, in, these, uh, in these romances, these medieval romances, uh, Joseph of Arimathea becomes Jesus's uncle. So he's his rich uncle. He's a merchant who regularly travels uh, to Britain in order to import tin or other things that Britain was known for exporting. Um, and at some point or other, he, might, he bright, brings also the boy Jesus on one of those uh, trading missions, according to this uh, particular legend that's invented in the Middle Ages and is much popularized by um, the monks of the monastery of Glastonbury where they claim that Jesus walked there and then people would, could come to Glastonbury and walk where Jesus walked and, and leave alms and so on. It was a very uh, lucrative trade for, for the monks to popularize that. Um, even this part about Joseph of Arimathea then also collecting the Holy Grail and so forth, that's even mentioned in the, uh, the Monty Python rendition uh, of the Holy Grail story. Okay, so where else might have Jesus gone? <laughs> Was the young Jesus in India or Tibet? So lots of people have wanted to fill up Jesus's lost years with a trip to India to learn about Hinduism and Buddhism. And so, for example, in 1887, a Russian journalist, Nicholas Notovich, forged scrolls that claimed that Jesus was studying with Brahmin priests and later with Tibetan monks between the ages of 13 and 29 all across India and into the Himalayas. And so although uh, this was quickly shown to be a modern fraud, the idea that Jesus might have spent some time in India and Tibet maybe even remains popular. Um, another of such idea is maybe Jesus was in Kerala, India. So there is a Christian community in Kerala that has been there since antiquity, probably, and it has a much older tradition, dating at least to the Middle Ages, that their church was founded directly by St. Thomas the Apostle in the first century. Um, but in addition to that old tradition, there's an add-on more recently where people speculate, well, maybe the young Jesus studied Hinduism or even Buddhism while visiting Kerala's ancient first century uh, Jewish community. And so why not? Was Jesus spending those lost years in India? So that's not how history works. <laughs> so these speculations are tantalizing. People just think in their heads, well, Jesus' teachings do have something in common with Buddhism, and well, he could have traveled to India in those years. However, um, idle speculation like this is not how history works. There's no contemporary evidence for any of these fantastic hypotheticals, and thus historians unanimously dismiss them. So every historian of the uh, historical Jesus now here in the 21st century says there's no chance that Jesus certainly not went to India or England or even Japan. There's claims that in Japan that he went there or any other of these things. Jesus didn't, was not a traveler. Uh, there is no contemporary understanding, you know, that he has gone on any of these kind of trips. And this is not something you would fail to mention uh, if you were a regular, let's say, peasant guy from a little village called Nazareth. You wouldn't be known as Jesus of Nazareth. You'd be Jesus, that guy that went to Tibet, because <laughs> that would be quite an amazing uh, thing. You know, it might seem odd or tantalizing that Jesus has these lost years, but it's actually very, very rare to have childhood biographies for ancient figures. So we might ask ourselves, well, what about Socrates' lost years? Socrates, the father of Western philosophy. Did a young Socrates go to China and study philosophy under Confucius? The answer to that is no, he did not do that, even if it's possible that he could have or any such thing, there's no, uh, no, there's no evidence for any such thing. So the reality is that the perspective that events in childhood shape adults is very, very modern. We now think of um, uh, the self as developing as a result of inputs that we have throughout life. Uh, and so things that happened to me uh, things that I encountered or experienced as a child shaped uh, who I am. And that's how we frame biographies in the modern era. That's an entirely uh, modern invention that has only been around for a couple hundred years. Ancients um, uh, did not think that way at all. 
they mostly omit children from their text in general. Um, there are different, there are kids narratives and so on, but ancient writers are primarily using childhood stories to retrospectively presage a fated destiny. So in other words, you know that Julius Caesar is going to be this great uh, uh, general and ultimately dictator of the Roman Republic. And so any stories that you have, you might tell about him as a boy, uh, would be a story that shows that he's going to have that destiny and that already shows as a child because that's how ancients understood uh, your character as being preset. All right. So in this way, knowing who Jesus, the adult Jesus, became, as far as Christians anyway, of the late first century was concerned, when the author of Luke was writing that gospel, the author of Luke created that story I read at the beginning of the 12-year-old Jesus confounding the elders. In other words, knowing who Jesus became, Luke creates a story that retroactively presages who Jesus is. And certainly the trope of confounding the elders is a literary device that ancient writers regularly employed to retrospectively presage a figure's destiny. So this is just something that is in the trope uh, book of any great, um, let's say, wide sage or divine person you'd find in a Hellenistic romance novel. So. Among all of these attempts that I've mentioned to fill in Jesus' lost years, or so-called lost years, the infancy gospels of Thomas and James, the books that we're going to talk about tonight, have the advantage of being the oldest. <laughs> so both infancy Thomas and infancy James are known to Christian writers of the later second century, and the best uh, dating generally is that they're assumed that they've both written sometime either at one, you're around the year 150 or soon thereafter. So let's look first at the Gospel of Infancy Thomas. So like the Sayings Gospel of Thomas or the Coptic Gospel of Thomas that we've had a lecture on last month, Infancy Thomas, completely different book, is ascribed to the Apostle Thomas, that same Apostle I mentioned that the Christians in Kerala believe uh, traveled to their region of India to found their church, the seven churches, ancient churches of Kerala. The same character, if you um, are familiar with him, Thomas the Apostle is the doubting Thomas in the Gospel of John, who initially doubts reports of Jesus' resurrection until he himself can uh, witness the risen Christ. Um, we also heard that when we talked about the uh, the sayings gospel of Thomas, um, as uh, Gnostic Christianity evolved, the character of Thomas um, is ultimately seen. The word Thomas means uh, twin in Aramaic, and so Thomas is sometimes called uh, Didymus Thomas, Didymus being Greek word for twin. So Thomas the twin, Thomas is understood to be the twin brother of Jesus in a kind of a, again, Hellenic, Hellenistic sense of uh, the divine brother with his mortal twin. So Jesus is like, you know, it's like Castor and Pollux or uh, Hercules and, and Pedocles, whatever Hercules' mortal brother's name is, and so on. So Thomas being the mortal twin brother of Jesus in the Gnostic tradition. That's not how he is in, in this infancy gospel, uh, which is one of the reasons why the infancy gospel is not um, necessarily have anything to do with the Gnostics. So uh, the infancy gospel of Thomas does claim apostolic authorship. So some of the manuscripts begin with a prologue claiming Thomas as the author, but there is no indication that the in the text uh, in general that the author is supposed to be Jesus's brother or his twin, or even uh, that the character doesn't actually figure into the story or anything like that. But it does begin in this prologue, I, Thomas the Israelite, am reporting to you all my non-Jewish brothers and sisters to make known the extraordinary childhood deeds of our Lord Jesus Christ, what he did after his birth in my region. So um, as with really uh, the authors of the canonical gospels, who we by convenience call Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, but uh, whose names are actually tr only traditionally ascribed to those texts, the texts themselves are anonymous, 
Um, we don't actually know who the author of Infancy Thomas is. Um, the author of Infancy Thomas includes the Gospel of Luke's confounding of the elders story. So Infancy Thomas ends with that 12-year-old Jesus story in its text, along with stories about Jesus's father being a carpenter, which is something that's established in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 13, 55. And so from these and other reasons, um, scholars have concluded that Infancy Thomas is actually uh, uh, written by somebody who knows at least the Gospels of Luke and Matthew. So it's written long after Luke and Matthew's Gospels are written, probably after 150 AD, and so therefore it clearly can't be written by Thomas or anybody who knew the historical Jesus in the 30s. Again, somebody would be 100 and 140 years old or something like that by the time it, it's written, so no. So let's look at a little bit of the text from Infancy Thomas. Uh, this, I think, is a pretty characteristic story, one of the first stories in it. When the boy Jesus, it says, was five years old, he was playing at the ford of a rushing stream, and he gathered the disturbed water into pools, and he made them, pu made them the water, the pools of water, pure and excellent, commanding them by the character of his word alone and not by means of any deed. Then, taking soft clay from the mud, he formed 12 sparrows. It was the Sabbath when he did these things, and many children were with him. Certain Jew, seeing the boy Jesus with other children doing these things, went to his father Joseph and falsely accused the boy Jesus, saying, on the Sabbath he made clay, which is not lawful, and fashioned 12 sparrows. Well, I'm not sure that how that's a false accusation, because he actually did it. We just heard that he did it, but anyway. So he, he makes this accusation against Joseph. So Joseph came and rebuked Jesus, saying, why are you doing these things on the Sabbath? But Jesus, clapping his hands, commanded the birds with a shout in front of everyone and said, go, take flight, and remember me, living ones. And the sparrows, which you know had been previously been clay, taking flight, went away squawking. So the sparrows came to life and flew away. When the Pharisee saw this, he was amazed and reported it to all his friends. And we'll just mention here that uh, for the infancy Thomas, taking these illustrations from a 14th century manuscript, uh, Christian manuscript from Europe, which is already you know, pretty, um, you know, has a lot of anti-Semitism in it. So there's a lot of Jewish clothing and caricature for everybody except, including Joseph, but not really for Jesus, who is, is instead pictured differently as if he's somehow, you know, anyway, different from, <laughs> I don't know, everybody else in, in the village. So, all right. So this kind of thing, Sabbath breaking. This is, Sabbath breaking is a stock story in the um, canonical gospels. So there are arguments with Pharisees and other contemporary Jewish figures uh, over Sabbath observation and also the Mosaic Law. Those are familiar in the canonical Gospels. So for example, there's a story where Jesus and his disciples, they're casually walking through a field on the Sabbath and pluck grain. You're not supposed to harvest grain on the Sabbath. And so they get in trouble for that or get at least argued about with the uh, Pharisees for that. And also there's examples where Jesus is healing people on the Sabbath, with, which in the Pharisees and the Gospels anyway, seem to think is not something that you're allowed to do uh, in terms of not resting on the Sabbath and so forth. And so Jesus making clay birds and things like that and bringing them to life uh, fits into that same kind of stock story here. Um, but more than that, we can kind of see these kind of elements of equating uh, the boy Jesus here with uh, the God of the creation story. So by dividing and purifying water by his word alone, by fashioning animals out of clay and bringing them to life, the boy Jesus here is equated with the word or logos of God and the creation story of Genesis and the Gospel of John. So in Genesis 1.6, God divides the primordial waters. In Genesis 1.20, God creates every winged bird and in Genesis 2-7, God forms man from the dust, just as the boy Jesus here is forming clay birds, you know, real birds from, from clay. So, interestingly, um, this particular story of making uh, clay birds come to life is apparently referenced in the Quran. So in Surah 3, uh, 49, 
um, it says, Jesus will say to them, I have come to you with a sign from your Lord. That is, I create for you from clay something in the shape of a bird, then I blow in it and it becomes a living word, bird by the will of God. And I cure the blind, born blind and the leper, and I cause the dead to become alive by the will of God. And so um, the inclusion of this narrative, uh, which is not found, there's nothing about Jesus making uh, birds out of clay and bringing them to life in the canonical gospels or in mainline Christianity, the inclusion uh, kind of indicates probably that the infancy Thomas, the gospel of infancy Thomas, was probably treated as scripture uh, by the Eastern branch of Christians with whom Muhammad had contact in the seventh century. So in other words, this was one of the uh, wonders that Jesus was known to have done for them and that they would have told Muhammad about and that therefore makes its way into the Quran. Okay, um, overall uh, from there, there are just plenty of stories um, that are sort of kind of sassing out the idea what if a five-year-old, <laughs> you know, a toddler essentially has the power of God? And so all kinds of uh, mischief and antics happen, as you might imagine. So there's a narrative here. A child running tore into Jesus' shoulder, and Jesus said to him, you shall no longer go on your way. And instantly the child who had bumped into him died. At once the people of Nazareth, seeing that the child was dead, cried out and said, where was this boy, Jesus, born, that his word becomes a deed? And when they saw what happened, the parents of the dead boy blamed his father, Joseph, saying, because you have this boy, Jesus, you cannot live with us in this village. If you wish to be here, teach him at least to bless and not to curse. So they want him to not curse everybody like this and just, you know, I mean, causing the death of their kids by being around, he's a menace. Joseph then says to Jesus, why do you do and say such things? All the people here in, in Nazareth suffer and hate us. And the boy, Jesus, says to Joseph, if the words of my father, not Joseph, but his father in heaven, God, were not wise, he would not know how to instruct children. And again, he said, Jesus said, if these were children of the bridal chamber, they would not receive curses. These people shall receive their punishment. <laughs> And instantly, all of the kids and everybody who had been accusing Jesus of doing these things to him, which by the way, he was doing, uh, they are blinded and they went and they go blind. <laughs> anyway, so a teacher named Zacchaeus is standing, listening to Jesus, uh, you know, having this argument with his dad and doing all these horrible things and, and, and saying these things to his father. And the teacher says, oh, wicked boy. <laughs> and then he goes to Joseph and he says, come, bring him brother so that he may learn to love those his own age, honor old age, and revere elders, so that he may acquire a desire to be among children, also teaching them in return. But Joseph, who's real, more realistic and has a lot more uh, experience with this kid, says to the teacher, who is able to restrain this child and teach him? <laughs> so predictably, what happens, of course, is that uh, Jesus confounds his elders, so this teacher. So as Zacchaeus tries to teach Jesus the alphabet, actually the Greek alphabet, not the Aramaic alphabet, Jesus explains that he already knows everything from alpha to omega, including the real nature of the letter alpha, which uh, Zacchaeus, he contends, doesn't understand what it really means and what it really stands for. The boy Jesus explains that he himself knows wisdom that no one else has, including he knows the date when Zacchaeus is going to, was born and when he's going to die. And that therefore he, Jesus the boy, is the, is the real teacher. So although the teacher ends up, over after a long time, ends up giving up in shame, um, Jesus' behavior, as he goes on and gets a little older in the text, does seem to improve. So for example, um, uh, in the later episode, when children are playing with Jesus up on the roof of a building, a boy named Zeno happens to fall off the roof and die. You know, so for once, Jesus isn't at fault, so he hasn't cursed the boy and made him wither or die or blind or any of these things. Nevertheless, um, you know, with the experience that they've had, the townspeople accuse Jesus of killing Zeno uh, based on his past behavior, even though in this case he was actually innocent. 
to prove his innocence then, Jesus raises, the boy Jesus raises Zeno from the dead, and the resurrected boy testifies on his behalf that the fall had indeed been accidental, that Jesus had not actually cursed him to death or anything like that. See, he told you so. <laughs> um, anyway, there's more kinds of tricks that happen. So um, Jesus, when he's about eight years old, when his father, Joseph, who is identified, as we said, in the Gospel of Matthew as a carpenter, was making plows and yokes. And we say carpenter, what we probably mean here is a woodsmith. So he's a guy who is making things, and in this case, he's making plows and yokes. He received a bed from a certain rich man so that he might make it exceedingly great and suitable. And since one of the required pieces was shorter, and since Joseph did not have a measure, Joseph was distressed, not knowing what to do. So the boy Jesus came and said to his father, put down the two pieces of wood and align them uh, from your end. Joseph did just as Jesus said to him, and the boy stood at the other end and took hold of the short piece of wood and stretched it. And he made it equal to the other piece of wood. And he said to his father, do not be distressed, but do what you wish. And Joseph embraced and kissing him said, blessed am I for God gave me this boy. So, I mean, Jesus had, Joseph has had to endure all of these things of his neighbors not liking him because Jesus keeps cursing and killing all these neighbor kids and things like that. But at least, uh, you know, he's helping out with the carpentry at this point. At least uh, that's working out for him. So, <laughs> it, all, all worth it in the end. So, the text of Infancy Thomas ends by linking up with Luke's confounding the elders story when Jesus is 12 in the temple. And kind of in summary, Infancy Thomas, I'd say, is a kind of a semi-comedic uh, Greek romance tale about the antics of a god boy who is initially a little bit, um, <laughs> anyway, a little bit malevolent, but ultimately ends up, um, you know, being good. Uh, and it parallels, I would say, contemporary pagan stories, and so it would have been a very familiar kind of story. Uh, for ancient Greeks who know about uh, divine beings and human form and so on. So early Christian leaders uh, resoundingly denounce this text as heretical. Uh, they don't think that Jesus, even as a child, would have engaged in this sort of thing, but it remained very popular as a text. Uh, it continues to be copied in the Middle Ages and illustrated and things like that. I was in a, um, a church in France that had frescoes from the early Middle Ages that were narrating this. I was just kind of shocked that these stories, you know, anyway, just part of their regular church service because it's not part of the um, can canon, but it doesn't matter. It was popular and people continued to um, value the stories. All right, let's turn to the other one of the infancy gospels. The infancy, infancy James, or as it's usually called the Gospel of James, or the Proto-Gospel of James, the Proto-Evangelium of James. So this one is attributed to James, as we might expect, James the brother of Jesus. Um, so we should probably note here that due to the influence of King James of England and the King James Bible, in popular English we use the name James to refer to a number of New Testament figures that should more properly be called Jacob, you know, as it's another, like Jacob in the Old Testament. Um, so, for example, there are two apostles named James in most of these lists. Uh, one of these, James the son of Zebedee, and the other is James the son of Alphaeus, uh, and they're known as James the Greater and James the Lesser. So, you get, you get to be, you get, the good news, James, is you get to be one of the 12 apostles. The bad news is you're the lesser James in the list. Uh, so anyway, so James the Greater, if you've ever heard of this famous pilgrimage site in northern Spain, Santiago de Compostela, uh, Santiago, Jacob, St. Jacob is St. James the Greater. And just as the uh, Christians in Kerala believe that St. Thomas the Apostle came and founded the church there, uh, the folks in Spain felt that uh, St. James the Greater uh, came and was in, um, yeah, anyway, in Spain and is buried there in Compostela. Um, again, these are, not, uh, his, these are not historical, but they're very ancient traditions, or at least medieval traditions. All right, so James the brother of Jesus is actually, I would say, greater than James the Greater, although he does not make the apostle list. So James, the brother of Jesus, who is sometimes called James the Just, he's an important historical figure, and he's actually one of the very few early Christian leaders whose historicity is actually confirmed both by Paul, 
our earliest Christian author. Paul actually says he met James, the brother of Jesus, and he's also um, discussed by the Jewish historian Josephus, who has an episode about, uh, about his death, which is one of the episodes that is viewed as authentic uh, out of the Josephine canon, so anyway, out of what Josephus writes about. Uh, and in both of those stories, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, is identified as the leader of the Jerusalem church in the 50s and 60s, the person who takes over as leader of the community that Jesus had been leader of after Jesus' crucifixion. Um, there's also in the in the actual canonical New Testament, there's an epistle of James that's attributed to James, the brother of Jesus. And we also have an epistle of Jude in the New Testament who claims to be written by Jude, the brother of James, the brother of Jesus. <laughs> uh, but most scholars believe that although uh, those two epistles, James and Jude, reflect some of the perspectives of what we might call the Jamesian or Jacobin community in Jerusalem, the majority of scholars reject the idea that James or Jude are the actual authors of those texts. Um, we can certainly say that Infancy James is not written by James. So although Infancy James claims, now I, James, am the one who wrote this account, it's clear that James is not the author. So Josephus records that James was stoned to death, and that date could only, because of the description, it's not dated, but it either was in 62 or 69 AD, uh, based on the narration. Infancy James is dependent on Matthew and Luke, texts known to have written, been written after 70 AD, and actually likely in the 80s, and so therefore, infancy James could not have been written by, by James. Um, unlike infancy Thomas, so we went through, uh, the protagonist of infancy James is actually Jesus' mother, Mary. So infancy James tells uh, the story of the Mary, the mother of Jesus' life, and, and only being a, you know, a teenager when Jesus is born, she's actually doesn't have a huge long life before, uh, before we get to the Christmas story anyway. So Joseph, um, uh, Jesus' adoptive father, is not named in the canonical Gospels after those Christmas stories. Uh, Jesus' mother Mary, however, is mentioned or takes part in the narrative of the adult Jesus in all four Gospels. So especially prominent in Luke, um, not named in uh, in John's gospel, although, you know, Jesus's mother, you know, who we presume, you know, it means Mary, uh, does uh, prominently figure in a couple episodes of, of John's gospel, the wedding of Cana, and also at the crucifixion. So, um, even so, it actually turns out that the bulk of, when we say, say, Mary and lore, most of the things that we say or know or think we know about uh, Mary actually don't come from the, these kind of sparse um, gospel accounts in the New Testament. They actually come from infancy James, even though infancy James is left out of the gospels, out of the New Testament. So for example, the idea of the virgin birth is present in the nativity stories in Luke and Matthew. Um, it's not, it's the, they don't go into it in the kind of detail that we get in James. <laughs> And most of the other details about Mary are rooted in infancy James. So for example, the idea of the Immaculate Conception, and um, this is an easy uh, win at any, any trivia contest or an easy win, one to get wrong. If you ever ask anybody, what's the doctrine of Immaculate Conception? Everybody almost will always say, this is the idea you know, that Mary conceived uh, by the Holy Spirit and you know, had, had Jesus as a virgin. That is not the case. The Immaculate Conception is not uh, about Jesus' birth. Uh, it is rather that Mary was conceived without sin immaculately, and that she then lived a sinless life all the way until the birth of Jesus. And so in other words, Jesus is also born in a, in a mother vessel that is totally without sin. So that's the idea. And that idea doesn't come from um, Matthew or Luke. That idea comes from infancy James and ends up becoming a doctrine of the uh, Catholic and Orthodox churches. Okay, likewise, although Mary is identified as a young woman in the uh, canonical gospels, Joseph's age is not actually established in the New Testament. It's, if you ever think, oh, well, Joseph was an old man when he married Mary, 
infancy James is the source of that tradition. Um, and that's usually how he's pictured and understood. Although many New Testament texts also affirm that Jesus had sisters and brothers. We've mentioned, for example, James, the brother of Jesus, and also James's brother Jude, and there's several other brothers and sisters. Infancy James uh, makes it very clear that these are adopted siblings, not half brothers and sisters uh, that, whose mother is Mary. So according to infancy Mary, I'm sorry, infancy James, according to this text that we're talking about, Mary remains a perfect, perpetual uh, virgin after it says perpetual, or <laughs> perpetual is what we're trying to say, virgin after Jesus' birth. Uh, Jesus' siblings um, are explained as the older children of Joseph, who had a wife before, who had died prior to his marriage to Mary. And so you probably also heard that if you've ever heard anything about Jesus' siblings, that in other words, that they are adopted siblings, Joseph's, jo sorry, Joseph's children by a a previous wife. Since Joseph is simply Jesus' adoptive father, that means James, Jude, and the other siblings are likewise adopted siblings. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at infancy James. Infancy James begins with Mary's future parents, whom the text names Joachim and Anna. And so following on a rich tradition of scriptural models, uh, dating all the way back to Genesis with the Abram and Sarai stories, uh, but also including uh, the mothers of Samson, the judge, and Samuel, the prophet, uh, whose mother Hannah, you know, is also barren and can't have a child and prays to God to uh, uh, have a child in her old age, or as with John the Baptist, uh, who in the Gospel of Luke's mother Elizabeth has in the same condition, an older woman who uh, is not able to have children or hasn't been able to have children. Anna, whose name maybe even just be named after Samuel's mother, Anna, Hannah. H Anna here in this text has been unable to have children. Both she and Joachim have been enduring all kinds of mocking from uh, their neighbors and even their um, servants. And so Anna prays to God for a miracle. And we read in the text, and look, an angel of the Lord stood nearby saying to her, Anna, Anna, the Lord has heard your prayer You'll conceive and give birth, and your offspring will be spoken of through the whole world. And Anna said, as the Lord lives, whether I give birth to a boy or a girl, I'll bring it as a gift to, my Lord, to the Lord my God, and it will minister to him all the days of its life. So she's not promised boy or girl, and she immediately is ready for either one, but either way, uh, she is going to give the child as an oblate. So Anna miraculously does give birth to a girl who is named Mary. And when Mary turns three, her parents fulfill that pledge and give her to the priests who end up raising her inside the precincts of the Jerusalem temple. And she has a very um, hollow and holy, virginal elevated life in the temple. Um, and then we even read in the text, Mary was in the temple of the Lord. She was nurtured like a dove and she received food from the hand of an angel. So she's not even eating uh, earthly human food uh, while she's living this entirely um, sinless life within the temple. But when she became 12 years old, we read, there was a council of the priests saying, look, um, Mary has been in the temple of the Lord 12 years. Um, they're actually wrong because she's 12 years old and, and she came when she was three, so she's been there tw nine years. But anyway, this is what they say. Mary has been in the temple of the Lord 12 years. What should we do about her so that now that she's um, you know, going through puberty and she is now going to begin having her menstrual cycle, that's going to cause ritual impurity. That's going to pollute the sanctuary of the Lord our God. Women can't be uh, in the temple. And they said to the chief priest, you go stand at the altar of the Lord, go in and pray about her. And if the Lord, Lord reveals anything to you, we're going to do it. So that's our plan. All right. So the chief priest goes into the Holy of Holies and an angel there tells uh, him that what he needs to do is assemble all of the widowers of Israel. So get all the guys whose uh, wives have died, all the old men, and God subsequently will give a sign. And he gives a sign that of all these geezers, uh, Joseph is the one who's supposed to marry Mary. 
and we read it as the story goes on, Joseph refused, saying, look, I have two sons, all, I, mean, I have sons already, not two, uh, several sons already, and I'm an old man, and she's young. I won't be a laughing stock among the people of Israel. But the priest said, Joseph, fear the Lord your God, and remember what God did to Dathan, Abiron, and Korah, how the earth opened up and swallowed them all because of their rebellion. So citing this Exodus story about these rivals of Moses who are destroyed when the earth swallows them. And now fear Joseph so that those same things aren't going to happen to your house. <laughs> so it's a pretty strong uh, threat by the chief priest there. So Joseph reluctantly marries Mary, and he promises that he's going to project, protect the Virgin of the Lord in his care. So in other words, this is going to be a celibate uh, marriage. So Infancy James next follows the text of Luke, where the angel Gabriel announces uh, Jesus' conception to Mary, and then Mary goes on to go visit her aunt Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Um, at her return, Mary is now six months pregnant, so Joseph realizes she's pregnant, and he is faced with a dilemma. So we read in the text, Joseph struck his face and flung himself on the ground in sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, how can I look to the Lord God? What prayer can I say about this young girl since I took her as a virgin from the temple of the Lord God and I didn't protect her? Who has set this trap for me? Who has done this evil thing in my house? Who has defiled the virgin? Aren't I reliving the story of Adam? For as Adam was glorifying in the hour of prayer, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, and now it's happened to me. <laughs> so like a guy always, he's very... It's all the problem is about him, right? So, anyway, so the, all of the, the issue, there's a big issue going on, and it's all uh, it's all going to rebound on you know Joseph makes himself the the center of it. Anyway, an angel <clears throat> appears to Joseph in a dream, uh, reassures him, tells him what's going on, so that he now is uh, is you know, in on it and okay with it. Um, so, in other words, there's nobody's. Mary's still a virgin. Me meanwhile, the chief priest, however, finds out Mary's pregnant, and he is super mad. <laughs> and so when um, Joseph and Mary try to protest their innocence, the chief priest or, uh, uh, subjects them to an ordeal, which is to say like a you know, like a, how you have a trial by witches where you throw them into the pond, or how you uh, have to hold burning coals or walk on coals or whatever to prove that you're telling the truth. And this ordeal in this case is they have to drink the water of the Lord's rebuke in the wilderness. And I don't know, something's going to happen. It doesn't really explain what. But anyway, what ends up proving is actually they're innocent. And that is uh, totally an unexpected result. And, and, he does, and the chief priest doesn't even know what to make of it because uh, it shows that they're not lying. So... Uh, uh, they then respond to that same decree from Caesar Augustus for the census uh, that comes from the famous Christmas story in Luke's text. And so the infancy James text next has the couple travel to Bethlehem where there's no room for them in the inn. And thus the nativity takes place in a cave. Um, and this is frequently, if you're going to see any uh, depictions of this, a lot of times in Modern Protestant depictions, they, they have it being a stable because of the reference to a manger. Stable isn't actually mentioned in the text. Uh, and instead, in infancy, James, they go and there's a manger, of course, but they, the, the uh, nativity takes place in a cave. And if you go and see pictures of the nativity scene in Eastern Orthodox churches, it'll always be depicted in a cave because of this narrative in infancy, James. So um, after Jesus' birth, the midwife, uh, who really hadn't been needed, so she didn't need, the, the birth is very easy and happens without her help, but what she is there to do is confirm uh, after the birth that Mary was always a virgin and continues to be a virgin after, uh, after the birth of Jesus. So the midwife cries out and says, how great today is for me that I've seen this new miracle. And the midwife went out from the cave and Salome met her and she said to her, Salome, Salome, I have to describe a new sight to you. A virgin has given birth, which is against her nature. <laughs> um, Salome here then becomes kind of like uh, the doubting Thomas who doesn't believe that this is going to happen. She goes and tries to have a sign and uh, the sign is very negative as like her hand withers and so on. But anyway, the test results are in and 100% virgin here. There's been miraculous proof that we know that that's the case. So. The text concludes following Matthew's Christmas story. So uh, the Magi, the wise men, visit King Herod, and then the, uh, then the 
family, uh, and Herod, who uh, is upset and tricked uh, about being tricked and doesn't want to have a rival, massacres the innocents, the uh, young boys in Jerusalem. I'm sorry, in Bethlehem. The same story from Matthew, and then infancy. Uh, James here concludes with the murder and replacement of that chief priest, Zechariah, uh, the per chief who had raised Mary. And so it finally ends then with that testimony we read at the beginning of James, the purported author. So um, this ends up being a, a very influential text. Although infancy James is pseudepigraphical and was left out of the canon, uh, the text influenced later Christian tradition um, things like the doctrine of immaculate conception, this uh, emphasis on Mary's virginity, this become important, very important in uh, especially the Eastern and Catholic traditions. So as I mentioned, Greek Orthodox churches, we have a beautiful Greek Orthodox church just a couple of blocks from here that is decorated uh, with uh, icons and murals that are painted all over uh, the chapel. Um, and included in these are half a dozen of young Mary, Mary as a child, being given to the, uh, you know, being given to the priests of the temple. Her uh, sitting in the temple, being fed um, uh, manna by the angels, heavenly uh, food, uh, and so on. In other words, all of these pictures um, that are from infancy James, Joseph as an old widower, the nativity taking place in a cave. Um, so these have all become uh, worked into the narrative uh, even though this text is not part of the Bible in the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's part of the church itself. And so um, uh, these are ancient traditions. Um, as I say, they're not history. So like the Christmas stories in Matthew and Luke uh, that don't really have a historical basis, the infancy Thomas and infancy James, uh, they're ancient traditions. They don't date <laughs> all the way to the historical Jesus and don't really understand, I'm sorry, inform our understanding of the historical Jesus. The stories in Matthew, Luke, and James especially, uh, less so infancy Thomas, but it has also, you know, had some effects. As we mentioned, there's even a mention in the Quran, have significantly influenced Christian thinking about the characters of Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. And so that is our description of the Gospels of Jesus' childhood. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, um, I'm gonna in, we're gonna enter into a period of question and answering. And so I'm not sure if in the whole course of this there's already been questions, but I'm going to grab my phone and uh, take a look, and we'll see if we can uh, answer any of those questions and and see what's been said. So, Elizabeth says, uh, not sure, no, she says, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is seriously downhill. <laughs> and of course, uh, the road is, uh, back up is seriously uphill. Jerusalem is horribly hilly, and that road, that 4,000 year old road, uh, which is a treasure of humanity, has been blocked off by the Israeli Jews, seen it. So, um, yeah, so, so, um, there's a prob problems that we have, unfortunately, in being able to uh, tour these kind of sites at this point. Um, there's so many places, unfortunately, uh, in the Near East that are, uh, you know are the both the cradles of civilization and also the cradles of uh, of religion. But unfortunately, um, uh, they've also been contested by um, the the great religions, and so as a result of that. Um, Unfortunately, where we're at right now is that, um, yeah, the this ongoing ongoing problems which make it kind of hard to go and and uh, and be in all the different places or to go and participate them in, in, in them. Unfortunately, so yeah, I I wish I would love to have been able to go to that too, and I'm probably not planning to at this point. Um, Orlando writes, uh, how frequent were travels from the Middle East? to India in those times. So there's trade routes that are happening from the Middle East to India. So the issue is not whether or not people could go uh, from the Middle East to India. So uh, there are, uh, you know, the, at a certain points, uh, the, the Persian Empire, um, you know, before this is extended from, all the way from Europe to India. And Alexander the Great goes from Macedonia all the way to India. Um, it's not that people can't go to India, it's that 
uh, peasants uh, don't go to India, <laughs> and peasants who do go to India, you would know that that they went to India because they'd mention it. You know, so the, that's the issue here. So the issue is not that it's not possible to go to India and, the, and so on. The more issue is, it's okay, if you think that, um, let's say, there are ideas that are present in Buddhism and Hinduism that have made their way and influenced let's say Second Temple Judaism or early Christianity or Jesus's teachings or Greek philosophy, ideas travel easier, frankly, than people. Um, and so, yeah, so certainly people can travel. There's no sense at all that we have based on what we know about the historical Jesus uh, that he did travel. And so we can discount that as history. Um, are there any historical known travelers that covered that route? Yeah, so there are, you know, so I mean, Alexander the Great, I mentioned uh, went there. Um, and so on. So Trudy Gunderson says, we are realistic here. The young, so Trudy writes to us from Hawaii, and she says, the young physical Jesus did not make it to Hawaii. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, there is traditions that he went to Japan. But anyway, so yeah, he did make it to Hawaii, but his message and presence is here and throughout the world. So thank you, Trudy. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so he, uh, uh, Al-Bukhari uh, says, no, 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 that's what is it? That's the name of the hadith. Oh, that's the hadith. Yeah. Okay, there's a so toothless bulldog says. That's the user. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, uh, so there's a um, okay. So toothless bulldog writes. Allah uh, is quoting the uh, the hadith. Allah's messenger said the most awful name in Allah's sight on the day of resurrection will be that of a man calling himself uh, Malik al Malik, King of Kings. Um, all right, so um, that was just a comment. that's a comment, and so I'm, okay, that that's an interesting comment. I mean, so King of Kings is a um, is a uh, is a traditional uh, title of the Persian emperor. So the Persians have the first uh, truly kind of. Uh, in the West, in a way, truly global empire where they uh, subject all of these lesser kings. And so we, we use the word emperor for, for the Persian Shah or Shahanshah, king of kings. And so that's um, where that title comes from. And sometimes Christians um, attribute king of kings to Jesus, but obviously in the same way that, you know, they, the idea of it in that sense, though, it was entirely spiritual, not um not a physical kingdom like uh, the Persian Empire. Roan Wagner asks, does uh, Jesus have a different name like, uh, like Joshua? Yes. So Jesus' name, when we have these names like, so James is, this, I mentioned James because James is especially egregious, you know, that, that we took the name, um, you know, that's in, in Greek is like, you know, Yaakovos or whatever, but in, in some kind of, you know, name that comes, derives from the Hebrew and Aramaic. There's, so there's a Hebrew name, there's the Aramaic name, there's the Greek name. The New Testament is written in Greek. And uh, the Old Testament, you know, is written primarily in Hebrew and a little bit in Aramaic. When the King James scholars um, um, translated the text, for some reason they introduced for the, uh, the English versions of all these names, they have kind of a anglicized Hebrew names for all the Old Testament ones and a anglicized Greek names for all the New Testament ones and they don't make it consistent. And so, so for example, uh, Elijah is what we say in English for the Old Testament prophet Elijah. We call him Elias and he's a, his spirit is appearing in uh, the New Testament because that's the Greek or anglicized Greek form of Elijah, which is our anglicized Hebrew one. Same way, anglicized just to please the king, you know, of, of the New Testament, you know, uh, is James for Jacob. It's the same name for the Old Testament character. Likewise, uh, Jesus then, like you say, is Joshua. Uh, so Jesus or, or so on, Yeshua. Uh, Ron Wagner also asks, could the Gospels be referring to cousins where we read brothers and sisters? So that account is, uh, that is made. Um, so, there, and that argument is also made by um, you know, a number of historians of the, uh, of the historical Jesus. I don't think, um, I don't think there's any reason to go there in terms of saying uh, Jesus's cousins, because I, the, the historicity of one of Jesus's brothers, anyway, James, the brother of Jesus, is pretty well attested. He's called, um, 
Now, like I say, James, the brother of Jesus in Josephus, uh, Paul calls him James, the brother of our Lord, or James, the brother of the Lord. And there's a couple other things that I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a special uh, attribution that gets, you know, attached to this guy. And, you know, Christians are all calling each other brothers and everything like that. But this is a, um, uh, and there's all kinds of stories. Like you say, it, there's multiple stories where Je in all of the different gospels where Jesus has brothers and sisters and so on. And so, um, so yes, some people have made the uh, argument that that could mean cousins, but I'm not sure that that buys us very much. Um, well, so uh, Ron then also asks, if these books were influential, why weren't they adopted? Um, well, I think because uh, that they are, they're late, the um, early Christian leaders uh, did not believe that the stories are too fantastic or too fanciful and too, uh, in some cases, obnoxious, uh, where Jesus, is, as a boy, is cursing uh, people. So I don't think that infancy... Um, uh, Thomas had much of a chance of making it into the canon. The earliest uh, uh, Christian writers, uh, who were the kinds of people that are the doorkeepers in terms of the canon, were, uh, you know, universally denouncing it as uh, as a forgery or not not really written by uh, uh, Thomas. And they also didn't believe that James was, and so I think that's why why they're not adopted. They end up still being influential because. Um, they feel it's hard to uh, replace uh, something with nothing. So just because you get rid of these stories about Mary, people still want to know where did Mary come from? What's Mary's story? And they don't have any other story about her. And there is no way we can have a story, you know, actual history about her. And so not having any, uh, they kept that, um, those ideas, even though they didn't put it into the canon. Trudy asks, there is something beautiful of the Orthodox churches when you see the murals. Oh my goodness, I couldn't agree with you more. The walls are so covered, it tells the story. The early missionaries to Hawaii, uh, because the in, in, indigenous peoples could not read, pictures were used as a great teaching and learning tool. And of course, um, that would have been true throughout uh, most of the Middle Ages, you know, which is in ancient times, is that most of the people couldn't read. And so the teaching tool was uh, all of these kinds of frescoes, and stained glass windows, and in the West anyway, statues, although in the East, the people didn't want statues. And at certain points, they also argued against having uh, images because they were afraid of image worship and that kind of a thing. But like you say, um, they ended up keeping in the Orthodox churches a tradition of, of painting, of iconography, um, which has been maintained pretty, uh, pretty in a very traditional way for well over a thousand years. And the, the frescoes over here in this, um, the Greek Orthodox church just a few blocks away, uh, I just love them, they're so gorgeous. Um, Daryl Scott also asked why the books aren't canonical. So like I say, I think that the issue here is that uh, early church leaders who are in the councils don't believe, they're, they're making arguments that these are not written by the apostles they say they're written by and, and that they also are expressing false doctrines and that kind of thing. So Jesus, uh, as a boy, is not cursing people in their, in their view. Um, Jamie Carson Cantrell writes, could you give us um, more historical background on the creation of the infancy stories? So we don't, um, we don't know, so we know who they're attributed to, but they, we therefore don't know who, who actually wrote them. Um, uh, so in fact, uh, so I can't really, I think that uh, the, uh, I think that there's a sense that, um, that they were, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I think that there's a sense that one or more of them might have been, um, so the infancy Thomas may have been written in kind of Syria by kind of um, uh, uh, Aramaic speaking or Syriac speaking Christians originally or something like that, or that, you know, in other words, it's from that kind of area of the, of the Roman Empire. But we don't really, it's, it's fairly speculative and we don't know um, for sure uh, who wrote them. We can just say that they, are filling an author who wants to know these things, who um, you know is prepared to fill in details uh, about figures that they don't know based on their own either creativity. I think in the case of the infancy um, Thomas, where uh, where you know you think, well, what would a boy God actually do? And they write sort of a Hellenistic 
uh, a romance novel, or uh, based on um, you know how you they had written the gospels themselves had been written, which is to say based on their ideas of prophecy and doctrine uh, using um, Old Testament texts as a model, like we've talked about how uh, this barren woman and this child who is an oblate and so on, uh, the Mary story. In other words, because there's a sense in ancient times among early Christians that everything follows a pattern. And so uh, the, the things that happen in the Old Testament are archetypes of, the, of what's going to happen in the, in the new. And so they therefore are able to, uh, even though they don't personally know those details because they, don't have, they can't interview anybody who knew any of these kinds of details, they assume that those sorts of things happen based on their reading of scripture. Um, so uh, Project Malice asks, who was Josephus, a historian of the time? So Josephus is a first century um, Jewish historian. Uh, who writes uh, under the, um, under the uh, sponsorship of the Roman emperor after the Jewish uh, Roman war where, in the, where, the, where the temple's destroyed in 70. And so Josephus writes a lot of, um, of the history and he also writes in Antiquities of the Jews. And he himself is a, a bit of a uh, problematic source because he's, he's also writing on behalf of, uh, you know, trying to get Romans to, um, let's say, accept Jews as ancient and their traditions as valid on the one hand, but he's also trying to um, argue his own interpretation of Judaism and trying to get Jews, Jewish Judaism to kind of go in a particular direction. Um, he also was a participant in the in the war at a turncoat, so he's also wanting to save his own skin, and he's also you know a collaborator and all those kind of things at the end. And so anyway, so he is a complicated guy, but but he gives us almost all of the detail that we have on late Second Temple Judaism, first century Judaism, and so um, having uh, uh, his notices of of biblical figure, uh, New Testament figures, early Christian leaders, John the Baptist and James, the brother of Jesus, is really important uh, because the Christian movement is so unimportant that it's otherwise not really noticed uh, uh, by the Romans or hardly noticed by Roman historians otherwise. So um, Ben asks, how do you know that the stories told of the books you call Apocrypha don't bear some truths in them albeit told in a legendary way. So, um, so I'm not saying that they don't bear truths. Um, I'm saying that they don't, have, they don't have historicity. And so all of these um, stories bear truths, I think, um, as people are expressing, expressing their faith uh, and their understanding of the way the world works, of Christ's mission, of the gospel, and all those sorts of things. Uh, what they're not is, is actually having, a, having an actual historical basis. And the reason why they don't is they just don't date back to any, any contemporaries. Um, they are written after the fact when, when uh, and they have no, um, multiple, there's no multiple attestations. So there's not like multiple witnesses that are contemporary that are backing any of these things up the way we have, like I said, uh, with Josephus, a Jewish historian, for example. Um, the Right Honorable Maddie McCoon, uh, do you think that Christianity adopted certain beliefs or archetypes from other pre-Christian beliefs or schools of thought, like the concept of the divine child, like the cult of Mithras? Um, sure. <laughs> so I do think that the bunch of things that are happening um, uh, uh, simultaneously. So, so what the Christians, uh, what, the way Christianity kind of works is we, you start with a, um, uh, a movement of people who um, have renounced different kinds of worldliness and are following uh, this teacher, Jesus, who ultimately uh, is crucified by Roman authorities. And so all of these people who weren't expecting that to happen have to question uh, why did that happen? And a whole bunch of them, uh, beginning with Mary Magdalene and then uh, ultimately uh, Paul, have uh, visions of a risen Christ. And so they start to understand um, uh, Jesus as a Messiah in a very different way than, than Second Temple Judaism had been thinking about that. And then as time went on, they had to elaborate those ideas 
And so as a result of that, um, um, when they had understood Jesus as a son of God, as a divine, divine man, ultimately as uh, God, a, a ultimately a second person of uh, Christianity's Trinity, when that doctrine ultimately evolves. In the meantime, they are using um, you know, what they know, uh, the background information in order to, um, in order to tell, you know, kind of similar stories that, uh, from, from their own environment. And so, as I mentioned, the, the confounding of the elders trope, uh, that exists in, in Luke, uh, is a, is a common trope for, uh, uh, Hellenic, Hellenistic, uh, Greco-Roman, uh, understandings of god men or p- people with a divine, uh, uh, future and that kind of a thing, and there's a bunch of other ones like signs in the heavens, stars portending the birth, uh, wise men coming, you know, this kind of thing. These are all kind of these tropes for uh, a divine, uh, divine child, man, that kind of thing. So yes, and so then also things like you say, the cult of Mithras is another um, um, Western uh, mystery religion that uh, kind of claimed to be taking its uh, its origin from Mithras, a uh, kind of a, a Babylonian and Eastern an Eastern god, but it's actually kind of a Western interpretation, and it's really most popular among the, um, especially among the uh, the legionaries in the in the Western part of the frontiers and the provinces and things like that. And they have a bunch of um, practices uh, that you know that are similar to some of the things Christianity is doing, and in some ways there's an idea that um, that. All of these sort of Eastern mystery religions are are affecting the Roman Empire at a similar time and are have a similar place in the marketplace. Um, Melissa Thompson points out that awful originally meant inspiring awe, and so yes, that's true. So we, you know we have a lot of these words where uh, the, where the where the etymology has changed over the meaning. Uh, Panagia answers, if it's irrelevant, I was just curious where Mary Magdalene stories come from. So um, Mary Magdalene is uh, uh, also one of Jesus's disciples, an important disciple uh, who is multiply attested in, in lots of different gospels. Um, the stories you maybe are thinking about are stories like that she becomes Jesus's wife. That comes from things like um, uh, the Da Vinci Code and other discredited modern sources that are making up this idea. So there, there's no, it's a, not an ancient tradition at all. Um, it depends on what other Mary Magdalene stories you have. There's a Mary Magdalene stories that she traveled um, to France and so on. Um, this is like, um, you know, again, Thomas the Apostle goes to Carroll, India. Uh, James the Greater goes to Santiago de Compostela. We were in the city of Verona, uh, which I guess they were um, um, uh, humble enough to not try to say that, you know, like one of the big apostles like Mary Magdalene or somebody else came there. Instead, what they had the shrine to is the boy who brought the loaves and fishes during the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. When that boy grew up, he later went to Verona and he was buried there. So in other words, you people wanted to have, um, uh, you know, in Paris, they were claiming for a while that they had the grave of Dionysius the Areopagite, some guy who was converted in Athens by Paul. So in other words, people wanted to have connections to the biblical stories, the biblical, um, and, and, they cre- and they wanted to have saints around them. So people who were holy people, that, whose shrines were there, that they could come and feel like a personal connection to. And so some of these stories, um, like I say, like with the Kerala story or the, or the, um, uh, Santiago de Compostela story, those stories are at least very old, so they're over a thousand years old and so on. Uh, they just don't go all the way back to the time period when those historical figures, if indeed they are historical figures, uh, would have been alive. Um, please clarify, uh, there's a question, apocryphal uh, doesn't necessarily mean not true. <laughs> so, so, so we have to, um, so apocrypha, in any event, is, is a term that means hidden. And when we talk about apocryphal books, um, it, doesn't mean that the, it doesn't mean that they're not true books. It just means that they're not, didn't make it into the canon of the Bible. And, it, and actually, 
most of the books that are technically called the Apocrypha, they did make it into the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox canon of the Bible. They just don't in the Protestant canon. And so, um, and so, and, and they're called Apocrypha or hidden, um, even though they're not hidden. You can get them, in, there's a King James translation even of the Apocrypha. And so Apocrypha has tended to um, have the meaning of, of false, but it doesn't mean that. All right. Oh. Are there other questions? Yes. Oh, there's more questions. All right, sorry. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with the questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I think I have filtered out the questions, but I will ask our speaker to please oh, there's more. read the questions to yourself before you read them out loud, just in case. <laughs> So Ben points out, or he thinks, contends, the stories about Jesus' birth and his mother's were probably told and retold by word of mouth until they were written down decades later. They were probably true stories that got corrupted that way. It's not wise to dismiss them just because they were judged myths and legends. So possibly. Um, I, so I don't, I don't, um, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of, um, that, it's certainly possible. There's, you know, but there's no, there's no evidence for that is what I would say. So there's no particular reason to imagine that early Christians are, um, are interested in stories of, of Mary's birth. Um, certainly when we have our earliest uh, Christian writer, Paul, he doesn't talk anything about that. He's not interested in most of Jesus' teachings or anything like that. Um, uh, it's later, um, as Christianity develops, uh, that we actually then get stories of, of the Gospels of Jesus' um, uh, both teachings and also, um, you know, kind of part of his life. And it's only later that we get uh, the other details filled in as people started to be interested in those things. So I would argue actually that there's probably were not word of mouth traditions that are preserved for those things at all, but rather uh, there is a, uh, after Christianity is a thing and they're already now uh, focused on Jesus and they know these things about Jesus, people have additional questions that they want answered and that's when those answers uh, come into being. Um, Buck Spencer, if the Annunciation occurred, why does Mary and Jesus' brothers think that he's out of his mind in Mark 3.21? So, um, because Mark is written before Luke, and because, um, <laughs> and so the story of, of Mary and Jesus' brothers thinking that uh, Jesus is out of his mind in, um, in Mark 3.21 is created as a story before the Annunciation is created as a story, which is created by the author of Luke later. So that's why. <laughs> so if I can just, I mean, I don't know, that's because of the chronology of the stories, of how these stories evolved. So Ron Wagner asked, um, so both Mary and Jesus um, had a, a virgin birth. So um, I don't think that the Immaculate Conception, the Immaculate Conception of Mary is not a virgin birth. Um, I think that what it means is it's immaculate, in other words, it's without sin. So I don't know that uh, whatever, however the conception uh, takes place, in, in, it's, it's taking place in such a way where it's not under the, um, under the auspices of original sin, which is the condition of suffering in the world. So for some reason, there's a, um, the onus is taken away. The conception occurs immaculately. I don't think that that means though that, uh, that Mary's mother was a virgin or anything like that, but rather that her birth occurs uh, without original sin. She lives a sinless life and she has a virgin birth. I think that's how the doctrine works. Uh, Trudy asked, um, was academic legitimacy only held by a few? Therefore, what made it into the Gospels are only afforded to a few. How many women uh, would have contributed uh, if afforded education? I realize uh, this may be a whole presentation. Well, I, I totally agree. So we have to also understand with... Um, with any text, certainly any texts that are surviving from antiquity, the only people that are able to to actually be educated and write, and actually whose texts are able to survive are, are the elite. 
And so this is something that we always have to have in the back of our minds uh, whenever we're reading like any historical text, you know, so that, so the, the ability to go back and try to find, um, let's say what more common people uh, taught or did or anything like that, creating kind of um, more social histories of everyday life as opposed to just the political history of the elite or the ideas of the, uh, the rarefied few philosophers. And as you say, mostly male, although there are some educated women and there are some women writers in antiquity in the Middle Ages that have come down to us. So, uh, so the answer is, you know, yes. Uh, in terms of text, uh, you know, like, it's not that history is written by the victors, but the people who write history win history because they're the ones who write it. And so, um, and it's only people who have the, uh, the training ability, leisure and wealth to write who are able to write and it's only a fraction of those texts that, uh, that survive. So the overwhelming bulk uh, do not survive because only the important ones are ones that people later feel are important get copied and preserved in, in the monasteries and so forth all the way down to the present. Um, and so one of the things that is interesting about a figure like Jesus, the historical Jesus, who we don't really have access to um, uh, and who didn't write a book and who uh, and who we don't really have any eyewitness accounts. So his disciples and he probably were um, uh, re of relatively humble origin. The tradition as it occurs in our first gospel, Mark, is that he's a carpenter, he's a woodworker. So in other words, he is from this town, Nazareth. Uh, this town is a little peasant town, which uh, ha has not mentioned in history at all until Jesus. And Jesus is known from being there because he's called of Nazareth all the time. And so, um, and so one of the things that we do have in Jesus is someone whose influence ultimately goes on to being a very important, you know, world leader, you know, this critically important uh, in terms of the effects on, on the planet, but whose uh, actual lived life is in pretty humble circumstances and may not have had uh, been afforded a lot of education, although by the time the narratives are written down, he can you know, read Greek and so on. Uh, but we don't know in terms of the historical Jesus. So Noel writes, it seems like whenever Jesus the child was called out on something, he turned it around on his teachers or his elders. Was there ever anything that implied that Jesus was given a moment of uh, to a timeout or correction uh, that he followed through with. Um, so it is kind of an interesting, um, I, that is kind of an interesting understanding and, and, and thing that's happening. And one of the reasons why um, uh, Joseph is really exacerbated, uh, you know, by him and also the teachers ultimately, uh, there's two different teachers that try to, try to discipline him and things like that. You know, ancient uh, discipline involved uh, you know, you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child, right? And so, you know, having to, uh, you know, the, the, the teacher is, you know, wrapping you on the knuckles and this kind of thing. Uh, and you couldn't do that with a kid who uh, could curse you dead. And so, like, um, essentially, like Joseph is saying, you know, who can control this child, you know? And so, no, in, the, in this particular story, there, uh, my infancy Thomas, um, there's nothing anybody can do to give him a timeout or restrain him. Yes. So, um, so Ben says, according to you, Mark did not have the virgin birth. Maybe he discredited it altogether. John does not have the story either. Ergo, the virgin birth did not occur. How do we judge uh, what is true? So, so there's a difference between truth and, uh, and history. And so uh, what we're trying to do here, what I've tried to do here when we're doing these lectures is uh, we are looking at, you know, we are looking on the one hand at historicity, but we're also looking at, at narrative and stories. So yeah, Mark, um, Mark uh, the idea of a, of a virgin birth is not there. It's an idea that is later present and it later becomes important to Christians. Um, but that because it's not initially important to Christians and it's not initially uh, listed, there is not any particular reason to think that it's a historical event or that it has any historicity. It becomes an idea and a doctrine that is valuable and has meaning to a bunch of Christians, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it has 
historicity. So, how are we doing, Leandro? So I want to thank everybody. This has been a fantastic discussion. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's a fun, uh, fun text and so on. And so we invite you to please subscribe to our channel. We've got lots of other lectures where we talk about things like historicity. We talk, look into how can we understand what we can understand about the historical Jesus. We look at uh, uh, source criticism, how the, uh, the texts of the canonical gospels and our earliest gospels are there. And so there's plenty more ways that uh, uh, we can wrestle with and, uh, and get into these kind of questions. And so I invite you to do that. Thank you so very much.